This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. In celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force, our Military History Night for April the 10th featured Canadian author Roddy McKenzie speaking on Bomber Command, the RCAF's greatest triumph. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Military History Night. I'm the event chair, James Ellis. I hope everyone had a great Easter and you've all been enjoying the glorious spring weather we have. Long wet may it remain, and hopefully it just rolls straight into the summer. Tonight's speaker is a retired Vancouver lawyer whose father, Roland McKenzie, DFC of Calgary, piloted a Bomber Command Lancaster in 34 combat sorties over Nazi-controlled Europe from April to August 1944. Curiosity about his dad's wartime service led Roddy into six years of researching, speaking, and writing about Bomber Command. In 2023, his book, Bomber Command, Churchill's Greatest Triumph, was published in the UK, copies of which, I'm delighted to say, will be on sale after his talk. I highly recommend it. I've got a copy myself. He's going to sign for me. Roddy's research reveals the Allies actually had limited knowledge of Bomber Command's accomplishments, so he turned to the Germans. They knew exactly what Bomber Command did. The results, as you will hear from his talk this evening, are extraordinary. Roddy learned that a horrendous cost in aircrew killed and aircraft lost, Canada's bomber boys were vital to Allied victory in the Second World War. Please give a warm welcome to Roddy McKenzie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is that coming in range? So you, you can hear me. Okay, good. This is the book. And on the front cover is a Royal New Zealand aircraft. It's a Royal New Zealand Air Force Lancaster from 75 Squadron, which was the New Zealanders, because uh, Bomber Command was a four-nation thing. New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Britain. And the New Zealanders sometimes kind of get overlooked but I'm a member of their Bomber Command Association as I'm also a member of the Australian Bomber Command Association and I'm a life member of the Bomber Command Museum of Canada. So it's a, a New Zealand bomber and they're really happy about that and it's ground crew. Uh, one of my close friends um, in Vancouver, who's now 102, was in Royal Canadian Air Force ground crew and they always get ignored and um, uh, he was really thrilled that there's got ground crew there. Um, when you open the book up, the first thing that you see is a letter from this austere gentleman, Air Chief Marshal Sir Michael Graydon, who was the commanding officer of the Royal Air Force. And his letter concludes by saying, I was both informed and moved by that book. Uh, the next letter is from the Deputy Commander of the Royal Canadian Air Force, uh, Major General Colin Kiever, and he says, I am honored to commend this book and sincerely thank Roddy for sharing his father and his accomplishments with us in such a meaningful and heartfelt way. His dad would be even prouder of him than I am. That's Deputy Commander of Royal Canadian Air Force. And then next is Air Vice Marshal uh, Paul Robinson of the Royal Air Force, who on the front cover says, those with an interest in the events of the Second World War uh, should read this book. And the very first person, which I kind of missed here, is Alan Packwood, one of the world's leading um, uh, Churchillians and the director of the Churchill Archives at Cambridge University and um, he has written the preface. He and uh, Air Vice Marshal Paul Robinson were my great uh, mentors in this whole undertaking. The back cover has got Peter Mansbridge who says he's here tonight in spirit. He was hoping to come. He says Bomber Command is a tour de force it's simply a masterpiece of reflection, anecdotes, and history. There's so much here I didn't know, and I thought I knew a lot. Future generations will read this book as they bloody well should. So that's uh, Peter. And that's, of course, one of only two Lancasters in the world that actually fly. This is the one in Hamilton. The other one's across in Britain. Um, I did not want to write a textbook. Uh, it's a lot of compelling stories, but there's 650 footnotes so that you know that... Um, uh, 
uh, I know what I'm talking about and you know where it all comes from. And it's also got about a 50 page index, which uh, the publishers say is solid gold for a lot of purposes. Uh, the book was published on the 15th of January, 2023, and it sold out by November. And uh, the second printing is, is now underway. That's the book. And the book is $60, and you can either pay just straight cash, or uh, if you want to use a credit card, I think James has arranged something in that regard. So we'll, we'll do that afterwards. Um, fighters and Bombers. Regarding Fighters and Bombers, Churchill said, the fighters are our salvation, but the bombers alone will provide the means of victory. Now, as it happens, my dad's younger brother, my uncle Bruce McKenzie, was a fighter pilot. He flew 131 combat sorties in the Spitfire in 441 Squadron, RCAF, in uh, 1944. Um, one of Churchill's most famous quotes was, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Most people think he's talking about fighter pilots. But this was a speech he made in Parliament, and here's the very next sentence. The very next sentence that's always ignored. He says, all hearts go out to the fighter pilots whose brilliant actions we see with our own eyes day after day, but we must never forget all that time, night after night, month after month, our bomber squadrons travel far into Germany and inflict shattering blows upon the whole of the technical and war-making structure of the Nazi power. So the statement's actually far more about bomber command than it is about fighter command. Uh, there were three major casualties of uh, World War II. In each case, uh, it's a terrible wrong. The first was our Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King, who was our greatest Prime Minister, our longest serving Prime Minister, our most brilliant Prime Minister, who, thank goodness, had a doctorate from Harvard in economics and made a number of decisions during the war that led us to tremendous pro prosperity as opposed to bankruptcy. And he had such an extraordinary relationship with Roosevelt that this was all made possible. But of course, post-war, uh, his diaries were not destroyed. And five years later, um, uh, somebody in the civil service uh, leaked one of them. People learned that he was a spiritualist. And then that just became the whole image of uh, Mackenzie King. The Canadian Encyclopedia says those diaries are the most important documents existing in Canada for governance of this nation in the first half of the 20th century. The second is Sir Arthur Harris, who was without question one of the allied, uh, uh, finest allied leaders. He was the head of Bomber Command. Bomber Command was falling apart uh, before he took over, and he accomplished miracles. Um, he too has had a terrible uh, post-war reputation. And the third is Bomber Command itself. I had a real shock yesterday. I went to the um, uh, Duke of uh, Cornwall place for lunch. I'm a lawyer, and a bunch of people came in, and they were clearly lawyers. So we struck up a conversation. They asked why I was here from Vancouver. I said for the uh, eclipse at um, Niagara Falls. I was in Niagara Falls on uh, Monday. And also Bomber Command. Not one of those lawyers, and these are senior lawyers, not one of those lawyers had ever heard of Bomber Command. One out of every four Canadians killed in World War II was killed in Bomber Command. And these people hadn't even heard of Bomber Command. And that gets me to the 19th of January, 1992, when the Canadian Broadcast Corporation and the National Film Board hit the lowest they have ever hit ever. They broadcast Death by Blue Moonlight as part of the Valor and the Horror series. And essentially what Brian and Terence McKenna said was Bomber Command didn't do anything except bomb innocent villages of no strategic or military value because they like killing a lot of children and women. That's what they said. And we made no contribution to winning that war. Well, there was a huge uprising after that. You know, I was actually glad my dad had died six months later. Some bomber boys were absolutely crushed by that broadcast. They thought they were war criminals. Now, there was a huge lawsuit launched and the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, got themselves out of it by saying they would not recognize bomber boys as a class for a class action. That same court, of course, three years ago, uh, recognized Uber drivers as a class action, but uh, not the bomber boys. So it went to the Senate. 
The Senate did a complete investigation and said, we know that we're supposed to give a lot of latitude to producers of these documentaries, the artistic people, the broadcasters, they're all entitled to their opinions. But in the words of the Canadian Senate, there is not one scintilla of evidence to support anything they say in that broadcast. Now, I don't think anybody even knows the Senate looked at it. Everybody just knows about that horrible night when they broadcast it. And a lot of the uh, bomber boys really came back um, traumatized. Of the 125,000 air crew, um, 80,000 were casualties, and of these, 58,000 were killed. And then there was the ones that seemed to be okay when they came back, but we had this concept of lack of moral fiber, and then you were totally disgraced as being a coward, when in fact it was post-traumatic stress disorder. So a lot of the guys that did come back suppressed everything. Uh, my own father, um, uh, was a very fine person and he was a great figure in the Royal Bank of Canada and all of that um, but he emotionally really wasn't able to connect very well not with me at any rate and uh, secondly he did have some anger issues and thirdly uh, he was a perfectionist now the only reason I'm born is because he was a perfectionist he actually got in and out of all those death traps without making a mistake and if you made a mistake, it was almost always a fatal mistake. So I should be indebted for that. But um, um, I was on a train uh, on the 14th of May 2018 in London, going up to uh, Lincolnshire. And it's one of those things where you have a table and you're facing people. And there was an Australian woman. Uh, before I sat down, as I sat down, before the train even started moving, she said to me, so, you know, who are you and where are you going? So I said who I was, and I was going to Lincolnshire. She said why. I told her about Bomber Command. And then this Australian woman said to me, my dad, my grandfather, my grandfather was in Bomber Command in World War II. And he came back to Australia, and he was drinking, and he had some anger issues. And my grandmother said it's intolerable. She threw him out, and she forbid anybody in the family to even speak to him. And I've been thinking about him more and more, you know, over the years. But she said after hearing you, I am ashamed of how our family uh, treated uh, my grandmother, uh, grandfather. And so we had a, a lot of that, and it was, it was very, very sad. Now, in my own case, something really interesting happened. We have this lovely Lancaster that all four engines work at the Bomber Command Museum of Canada, which is in Nanton, Alberta. And uh, i had been going by that land. It was on the roadside since 1960. So uh, I'd gone past it a lot of times. But one day in the late uh, 80s, I was alone with my father, which was unusual. We were on our way to Lethbridge, and we stopped. And at that point, they'd now made a little parking lot, and they had a little white picket fence around the Lancaster. It's now in a building, but at that time, at least you know, they had a picket fence. So we stopped, and we got out. My dad was quite taciturn. I'm not. And so we got out of the car, and I announced to everybody that uh, my dad flew one of these in the war. Because what I knew about World War II until six years ago is my father was a pilot who flew a Lancaster that dropped bombs. And that was really about all that I knew. So I announced to everybody that he flew one of these. So a couple of the gentlemen spoke with him and said, is this correct? They had a bit of a talk. And so then they had the keys. So they opened up the Lancaster and said, we were welcome to stay in the Lancaster as long as we wished. So they opened up and we got in there. Dad showed me where people sat. He said a few words about uh, um, the, the plane, etc. It was very, very taciturn and showed where he as pilot was, etc. And then we just sat there. And I don't know if we were there for 20 minutes. I don't know if we were there for an hour. It was just, uh, we just sat there. And then Dad suddenly came out of this uh, trance and said, time to go. And within two minutes, we'd gotten out of that plane. We said all our goodbyes and our thank yous. We're in the car and we're back on the highway. But as we left Nanton, my dad started talking. He uh, had both hands on the wheel, and he kept looking forward, and he very, very clearly and concisely and slowly, he explained exactly what you had to do to get a Lancaster into a target, to hit the target, and get out without getting yourself killed. He talked about corkscrews, he talked about the uh, anti-aircraft guns, he talked about the uh, night fighters the Germans had, etc., etc. He never gave me a clue of what squadron he was in or anything like that. But as we approached the Lethbridge city limits, he stopped talking, and he died about uh, four years later. Uh, Bomber Command Composition. Bomber Command had air crew from 62 nations. It was essentially a merging of New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Britain, 
Um, but we also had squadrons from uh, countries such as Poland and uh, France. The only separate bomber group in Bomber Command was 6th Group, the Royal Canadian Air Force. Other than that, everything was RAF. Now, um, the uh, two big surprises that I had in uh, my um, uh, study uh, about, about this situation is that Canada was far, far more independent running Bomber Command uh, uh, Bomber Group 6 than I'd realized. Uh, uh, Sir Arthur Harris was not in favor of a non-RAF bomber group. We wanted Lancasters, he gave us Halifaxes, he also gave us uh, Wellingtons. Um, but um, we had a Canadian command structure top to bottom. And uh, 1943 was a tough year kind of, you know, because it was the first major year. Um, but by 1944 we really got into the groove and we had Black Mike McEwen of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and Griswold, Manitoba, and he converted Six Group into something extraordinary. We ended up with the highest accuracy rate and the lowest casualty rate of all bomber groups in Bomber Command. Um, we uh, talked, or uh, there was a reference to the casualties, and the casualties were absolutely terrible. As I said, one out of every four Canadians killed in that war in uniform uh, was killed in Bomber Command. One out of every five Australians killed in that war uh, was killed in Bomber Command. My dad's squadron. My dad's squadron <coughs> flew for 27 months. Uh, he flew missions from, as I said, uh, April to August 44. Uh, in those 27 months, they had 944 um, people killed, and of these, um, um, 155 were Canadians, 65 were Australians, and 11 were New Zealanders. To have that casualty rate, 944 killed in 27 months, it meant the entire squadron was wiped out five and a half times. Totally wiped out. My dad started flying on the 1st of April, 44, and um, in March of 44, they'd lost 45% of the entire squadron uh, in that one month. Nanton is the National uh, Bomber Command Memorial and Museum, and the uh, names of all Canadian bomber boys in combat um, who were killed have their names there, regardless of whether they were in the RCF, 6th Group Bomber Command, or they were like the 155 Canadians in my dad's Royal Air Force uh, Squadron. Uh, they're all listed. So, how did I get around to doing this? What happened? One of the triggers is I was in the Pentagon. And when they learned about my father, the uh, officers of the United States Air Force kind of took me into their area and said, Bomber Command had the finest air crew of any, aircraft, any air force anywhere in the world ever. Bomber Command had the finest air crew of any air force anywhere in the world ever. Your father, Roddy, flew with the best of the best. Well, that really kind of got me thinking uh, how on earth that would happen. Uh, and of course, it had to do in part with uh, our training. Um, we had extraordinarily fine aircraft training, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. But first, I have to talk about Winston Churchill and William Lyon Mackenzie King. This is the 150th anniversary of the birth of both. Now, a number of places are acknowledging the 150th anniversary of Churchill. I don't think anybody's acknowledging that for Mackenzie King. Uh, Churchill was born on the 30th of November, 1874. Mackenzie King was born 18 days later on the 17th of December. So it's the 150th birthday of both of them. Now, what's important is that they first met in 1900. And that first meeting was not a success. Their second meeting was in London. And in London, uh, Churchill said, it seems to me that when uh, we met in Canada, I made a frightful ass of myself. Uh, Mackenzie King replied, well, Mr. Churchill, a great many Canadians would agree with you. <laughs> and I'm one of them. And that launched one of the great friendships of the 20th century. You know, Mackenzie King had been Prime Minister for 14 years when Churchill was made Prime Minister in May of 1940. A month later, the French surrendered. Canada was now the second biggest ally. But these two Prime Ministers had known each other since 1900. They developed a very, very strong friendship. They really understood one another, and they really offset each, uh, each other's strength and uh, weaknesses. It was a remarkable relationship. Uh, then there's Mackenzie King and the Roosevelts. 
Uh, most people are not aware that Mackenzie King won over both of the Roosevelts. He was summoned to uh, the White House in 1905 when he was just Minister of Labour. Uh, and so he talked to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, the Canadian Prime Minister, who had no idea who was summoned to Washington. But Laurier said, go down there and see what Roosevelt has to say. And Teddy Roosevelt said to him, I want you to be um, our channel of communication with the British Empire. 1940, his uh, um, fifth cousin Franklin Roosevelt said exactly the same thing. I want you to be our channel of communication. So Mackenzie King had won over both the Republican Teddy Roosevelt and the Democrat um, um, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, regarding Franklin Roosevelt, uh, he called Mackenzie King Mackenzie, and he's the only person I think that ever did that. Um, they were both uh, men with Harvard degrees. Um, um, and um, as leaders, they met uh, 20 times. Mackenzie King was a house guest nine times in the White House. He was a house guest at Hyde Park several times. He's the only foreign leader that was a house guest at Warm Springs, Georgia. Um, Franklin Roosevelt said that Mackenzie King was a great friend of his, one of whom he was very fond. Mackenzie King was the only for foreign leader at uh, FDR's private funeral at Hyde Park. Then there's the issue of Harris and the Americans. What was his relationship with America? Uh, in 1941, 10 days after he arrived in America to expedite war supplies to Britain, Harris was summoned by Franklin Roosevelt to talk about German invasion of Soviet uh, Russia. In Washington, Harris became friends with General George Marshall. He was already friends with General Hap Arnold and Ira Eaker from the 1930s. Harris was still in America when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, but Churchill quickly called him back to Britain and on the 22nd of February 42 made him Air Officer Commanding in Chief of Bomber Command, a position Harris held for the duration of the war. He proved to be the most brilliant appointment Churchill made. Until Harris took over in 42, Bomber Command was a disarray and being in danger was simply shut down. Now back in Britain, he moved into a, a nice home, Springsfield, and his first American guest was Ira Eaker, who was his counterpart in what I will call the Mighty Eighth. Its official name was the United States Army Air Force Roman numeral eight Bomber Command. And meanwhile, we're Bomber Command, so it gets very confusing. So I'll just call it the, um, uh, the, the Mighty Eighth. And um, um, I was saying, you know, in my uh, surprises in the research, the, that Canada was so much more independent than I'd realized. Well, America was much, much closer than I realized. Um, uh, Ira Eaker arrived for dinner and ended up spending several weeks as a house guest uh, until he found his own place. He put their headquarters in the same little village as uh, Harris and those two men met every day, seven days a week, to review what they had done the day before and what they were about to do. Uh, it was a very, very close relationship but it was an unusual relationship because we had far better airplanes, we had far better bombs, and we had far better air crew, and we had far better navigation than they did. Uh, Ira Eaker himself said that America was the little brother uh, in this relationship. Now, that gets us to the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. This is where the world's finest air crew came from. Churchill and Mackenzie King were of one mind. If we don't control the air, we lose the war. We have to control the air. So it became a Commonwealth undertaking. Commonwealth had six countries in those days. Ireland was officially neutral. South Africa was preoccupied with the African War. So the remaining four countries uh, signed an agreement on Mackenzie King's birthday, December 17, 1939, in Ottawa uh, to create the uh, air training program. Um, it's called the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan Agreement, and most people just call it the plan. Australia contributed $65 million to this air training plan. Uh, Britain contributed $54 million, plus $162 million in used equipment. New Zealand, $48 million, and ultimately America contributed $284 million because FDR was so impressed with what was happening. Roosevelt actually went so far as to say, after saying America was the arsenal of democracy, Roosevelt said Canada was the aerodrome of democracy. And the person that gave him that fabulous quote was none other than Mike Pearson. Um, 
any rate, um, so America put in the 284 million, New Zealand 48 million, Britain 54 million, and Australia 65 million. So what did Canada put in? We contributed 1.6 billion dollars. 11 million Canadians spent 1.6 billion dollars. Mackenzie King became a master at selling victory bonds. And the population trusted him and knew that their money would not go astray, and so they spent 1.6 billion dollars. Uh, they created 104 flying schools, 231 locations, 104,000 staff, and 11,000 aircraft. We had to make runways. We used so much cement in Asheville to build all these runways, we could have built a two-lane highway from Ottawa to Vancouver. And what do we get? We got 131,553 air crew, the finest air crew of any for air force uh, ever anywhere. Um, uh, September of 1942 was uh, sort of a, a big day for my dad. Uh, he was graduating from the plan and he went from the lowest of the low rank. He joined the Air Force after working for the Royal Bank for uh, 14 years um, and he was 28 years old and um, no, he started working with the Royal when he was 16. Um, 1928, 30, 40, yeah, 14 years. And um, uh, he said he didn't care what rank he got, he just wanted to be in the Air Force. So they made him a, a leading aircraftsman number two, which is the lowest of the lowest of the low. And um, uh, he graduated in Saskatoon and um, uh, got his wings and was commissioned as an officer. Uh, he got the highest marks in the school. But this is where the Royal Bank of Canada comes in. The, the Royal Bank of Canada actually ended up playing a pretty major role in that war and a huge role in my dad's life because um, uh, he worked for them for 44 years from when he was 16 until he was 60. Anyways, I found this letter in the Royal Bank of Canada files. This has come apart, does not matter? This thing here? Okay. Uh, it's okay. Okay. Uh, anyways, this is a Royal Bank of Canada letter, and the manager of the bank in Saskatoon is writing to the divisional headquarters in Calgary, and uh, it's talking about my father and uh, the fact that he had been the top in his class. But uh, the um, the Royal Bank manager in Saskatoon says to the Albertans, "You'll no doubt be interested to learn that his marks were the highest that had ever been recorded in this flying school since its inception." That's the Royal Bank of Canada. And guess where I spent this morning? The head office of the Royal Bank of Canada. Guess who's got my book? Dave Mackay has got my book. What happened was, um, the three great pillars of my dad's professional life were the Royal Canadian Air Force, the Royal Air Force, and the Royal Bank. Uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force turned him into a pilot and turned him into a flying instructor, which he said was more dangerous than anything he ever did in Germany. And, uh, then seconded him to the uh, British, um, the Royal Air Force, uh, uh, took him to England and trained him to be a bomber pilot and sent him on 34 combat uh, sorties and awarded him the Distinguished Flying Cross. The Royal Bank of Canada hired him as a 16-year-old and just two years later uh, they sent him way up to the Peace River country and uh, he, it was a sink or swim situation and he, uh, he, he uh, managed to, to um, swim. I, I never understood why. I thought it was like sent to the North Pole and maybe it was a terrible penalty. But I went up there and sometimes when you go there that you learn all kinds of things. He was in Fairview. Well, you couldn't get anywhere in Peace River Country until there were railways because it's surrounded by Muskeg. So the railway arrived in Fairview in 1928. Uh, uh, um, the village was formed in 1929 and in 1930 both the Royal Canadian, uh, both the um, Royal Bank of Canada and the United Church of Canada both arrived in 1930. Well, my dad, my dad was one of only two bankers uh, with the Royal Bank, and it was the only bank. And every train was unloading all these settlers from all over the place, and a lot of them were penniless. And, you know, I don't know what a telephone call costs in those days, but in fact, they were the only bank, they only had two people in it, and one of them is a 17-year-old, my father. He got very, very good at uh, uh, discerning people and their character, etc., etc. Uh, a really powerful thing when I went up there that I saw was, uh, they had a book about all of this, as a picture of these Russians, uh, a mother and a father and their two little boys, 
And that picture could have been taken a thousand years ago in Russia. They were still in, they were in rags, but they were in Russian clothing, etc. They arrived in Fairview with absolutely nothing. They were totally penniless. If the locals hadn't helped them, they would have frozen to death or starved to death that winter. But the next picture is taken in 1940. And one of these little Russian boys looking like a complete uh, ragaban type uh, penniless refugee is now wearing the um, uniform of the Royal Canadian Air Force. He's been commissioned as a pilot and as an officer. He's now a Canadian hero. And so um, my dad was up there in uh, Peace River uh, country uh, at Fairview um, having to deal with all of this and he dealt so well with it that when he was brought back to Alberta, it was right into the head office, and he was in the head office ever since. Um, yeah, the Royal Air Force, I think, saw the same thing in my father that the Royal Bank did. So this morning, I was actually at their headquarters. It struck me a week ago that the leaders of the um, uh, Royal Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force have been really supportive of what we're doing. But there were actually three pillars in my dad's life. The third was the Royal Bank. So I reached out to them about a week ago and this led to that, which led to the other, which led to directly my spending this morning at 200 Bay Street. And as I say, um, Dave Mackay himself now has the Bomber Command book. Because I'm looking to the Royal Bank for two things. I'm looking for support and I'm looking for guidance on how to make Canadians aware of Bomber Command. And I think these people, they've been extraordinarily good to me. Um, and so that's uh, really quite uh, um, important. In this letter that I did for uh, Dave Mackay, one of the things I said uh, in the fact that the book it really has a lot about the Royal Bank was that I said that your predecessor, uh, they called him the general manager in those days, a Dobson, wrote in his 1952 Christmas greeting to Royal Bank staff, to the 1,830 of our men in the armed forces, I send special greetings. At sea, on land, and in the sky, you are writing one of the proudest chapters in the history of bank. So, uh, Mackay's got that. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see where that goes. Now, the other thing is this flight uh, flying, uh, is, it's a real challenge. And my dad was doing the, uh, the training in, uh, he was trained in Vulcan and he did his flight instructing in Claire's home. There are a couple of uh, small towns about an hour and a half south of Calgary. So he was in Claire's home. Well, about 40 minutes from uh, Claire's home is Fort McLeod. And, uh, and then up north, Calgary is about maybe 90 minutes, maybe in those days it might have been two hours away. So my dad's flying and instructing in Claire's home, but in um, Fort McLeod, it was uh, a gentleman of the same rank in the RCAF uh, named uh, William Anderson, and in Calgary, uh, likewise the same, and uh, his name was uh, Peter Middleton. Well, Peter Middleton is the grandfather of Catherine, Princess of Wales. And William Anderson, his daughter got polio. She was born in 1943 in uh, Fort McLeod while he was being you know, a flying instructor. Uh, she was born in 43, but in 52, she got polio at the same time my mother did. And my mother got totally pol uh, paralyzed. She couldn't walk from then until her death in 1970. But uh, his daughter uh, was only sick for uh, two or three months and only had two lingering factors. One, her uh, voice cords were affected and two, her right hand was very affected. It meant that she had a very unusual voice and a very unusual playing of guitar. His daughter was Joni Mitchell. Yeah, her dad was with the RCF in the war and he was a flying instructor in Fort McLeod, yeah. So everybody was involved and that's why she's so unique. It's the polio that uh, uh, created both the voice and the way in which she plays the guitar. So, Canada entered the war with 11 million people totally crushed by the Depression. What did we contribute? We got 1.2 million Canadian volunteers in our armed forces. We got the world's fourth largest industrial economy, with all those dollar a year men running it. We got a devastatingly effective army. We got the world's third largest navy. And we got the world's fourth largest air force, even though we had more Canadians in the RAF than we had in our own air force. And after the war, we gave Britain, uh, during and after the war, gifts and loans of about $5 billion. All this from 11 million people. 
Now, when I did this speech to the uh, Royal Air Force Club um, back in uh, the 27th of last June, they had a formal black tie dinner and they had me tell them all about Bomber Command. Uh, I told them that the previous Sunday, Canada hit 40 million. Well, there was a gasp of 120 people at that dinner. A gasp. These 11 million Canadians, now 40 million of them? For all I know, Britain's population might be about the same today as it was during the war. I, I don't know how much has changed, really. But we went from 11 million to 40 million. And of course, as you all know, about three weeks ago, we passed and we're now 41 million, uh, 41 million Canadians. So, um, what the uh, fight was all about with the Air Force was we had this strategic bombing offensive. It was our Bomber Command and the Mighty Eight. We had the strategic bombing offense, the Luftwaffe called it the Defense of the Reich Campaign. Now, the German sources say that in overall casualties, uh, we and the Americans were only about 160 people apart. Our casualties were virtually identical, just over 80,000 in both cases, even though the Americans had flown for a much shorter period of time. Um, uh, they too were putting together a strategic bombing force in 1942, and that's they're probably the only world in the country in the world that could possibly have done that. This was the only strategic bombing force on the planet. No other country had anything like this. Um, but both Canada and America, uh, that was a, it was a huge uh, undertaking to, to pull that off. And so everything changed for the Luftwaffe uh, in January of 43. In January of 43, uh, the um, Luftwaffe was now forced to fight three aircraft, air forces rather than one. On January 23rd, 43, Canada bombed Germany for the first time. Four days later, on the 27th of 43, 27th of January, America likewise bombed Germany also for the first time. So by the end of January 43, they had to deal with the United States Air Force, although it was not called that, the Mighty Eighth, and the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Air Force, and that was important because all three air forces had very, very different ways of fighting. Harris had a very low opinion of the um, uh, Halifax, but we turned that Halifax into a remarkable plane, really souped up the engines, etc., and it could do a number of things that Lancasters couldn't do, and um, so it became a very, very valuable component to the war effort. The Wellington was just a draft death trap on those bombing missions, but we discovered it was perfect for laying mines. When the British were laying mines, they were losing an aircraft for every 37 mines they laid. We started laying the mines in the thousands. We shut down everything from the Bay of Biscay in France right up to the top part of Norway. We simply closed up. We, our, our mines blew up about 3,000 U-boats trying to get in and out of the ports. Um, so. Um, The only other real air force was that of the Soviet Union, but it was strictly tactical uh, and not strategic. Um, I've got to dispel Bomber Command myths, and there's three of them. The first one is Dresden. You know, uh, a lot of people think Dresden was just the, the, the massive bombing of civilians for, for no purpose. Uh, it was the subject of two of the biggest lies that uh, Joseph Goebbels told in World War II, and a lot of people still believe those lies today. The first one was on the casualties. Goebbels came out with a number that was 10 times what he knew the real number was. So he just increased the whole thing tenfold. And secondly, he said the place was of no military value, when in fact, it was a major communication center. It was the meeting of three of the most important railway lines. It had 150 um, factories that were making uh, war equipment. And most important of all, it was flooding with uh, German soldiers because they were trying to build a defense against the Red Army. And remember, at that time, the Red Army was our ally. The Red Army was only 70 miles from Dresden, and it was seriously overextended. And it was Stalin at Yalta that uh, asked Churchill and um, uh, Roosevelt to aid the Red Army through the Bomber Command the way they had aided the British Army, the Canadian Army, and the American Army at various times. Um, and so Churchill and FDR ordered the bombing, and Dresden was bombed by 719 British, 527 American, and 77 Canadian bombers from 13th to 15th of February 45. Um, the area bombing of civilians. This was not done. 
Ira Eaker, in defending British leadership, said, quote, no bomber's strike was ever scheduled that was not aimed at an important element of the enemy's war-making capacity. Harris said in March 45, we have never gone in for terror bombing. Attacks on cities, like any other act of war, are intolerable unless strategically justified. And then the final thing was inaccurate bombing. Early in the war, bombing was inaccurate. Navigation advances made it very accurate as the war progressed. For example, in his Distinguished Flying Cross, uh, the citation from my father said his he hit the target every time on all 34 missions. Now, on the mission that got him the DFC, he had to go over that target three times and everybody was getting blown out of the air, and it wasn't until the third time that they managed to hit the target. He managed to lose an engine, too, on his uh, Lancaster and got the place pretty badly shot up, but he still got the, the plane back to Britain, and that, that was one of the key points in uh, getting his uh, DFC. Now, just talking for a moment about accuracy, I, I've got two quick stories. Uh, a lot of people emerge in this book um, and one of them is Jimmy Stewart, the American actor. He was a master bomber of about 150 American bombers, and um, uh, some of his stories are quite telling. But uh, um, on this area of accuracy, uh, first of all, the Americans. Uh, they had um, uh, some of their B-24 liberators uh, bombing, and it turns out that uh, First of all, they didn't even have a target. It was just sort of a target of convenience um, in the city, but they got the wrong city. And not only did they get the wrong city, they got the wrong country. And so when they thought they were bombing Freiburg, Germany, they were in fact bombing Zurich, Switzerland. So they then had a court-martial, and Jimmy Stewart was the uh, chair of the court-martial. And the court-martialing uh, uh, committee, the court, uh, ruled that there would be no charges because, quote, the circumstances were all too familiar. Bad weather, inoperative navigation equipment, misidentification of terrain by the lead navigator. Um, the uh, navigator even compared wooded areas, marshalling yards, and a stream with uh, aerial photos of Freeburg to confirm they were in the right place. The jury of 12 officers found both pilots, uh, not all pilots, not guilty. In other words, this was happening so often, and this is in March of 45, it was happening so often that uh, the whole thing was dismissed. So, so that was American accuracy, because according to that book, The Bomber Mafia, they were saying, you know, from 30,000 feet with that Norden bomb site, which, by the way, didn't work, but uh, that, that they could drop a pickle into a, um, uh, they could drop a bomb into a, a pickle barrel. Well, in fact, when they actually tried it, and Curtis LeMay was still there, they thought they would knock out a ball bearing factory because they had this idea that if they could knock out some ball bearing factories then somehow Germany couldn't function and it would end the war. So Curtis LeMay was present and um, they bombed this uh, ball bearing factory using this Norden bomb site. They dropped 2,000 bombs, 2,000 bombs, 85 of them hit the target. Unless they're, they're pinpoint uh, bombing. In fact, then he went to Japan, and of course, Harvard University had just invented napalm, and he discovered if he filled his planes full of napalm, he could just flatten all these cities. He bombed, uh, uh, I think, 87 cities in Japan, and that was just mass bombing of napalm um, because he'd lost all interest in the precision bombing from what he experienced in uh, Europe. So, um, so now, what about bombing command accuracy? This is a story by a girl who was about, uh, uh, she, she grew up on uh, Hitler's Mountain, uh, Birch's Garden, um, and so uh, she, she, she was about uh, 12 years old uh, when the war was ending, and she describes what happens. Uh, this is what she said, uh, and this is the only time we ever bombed Birch's Garden or that whole area. This is what this girl said, on the deceptively, now she's now writing this as an adult, but she's remembering what happened when she was a child. On the deceptively clear morning of April 25, 1945, like a final thunderclap after a violent storm, British war pains came sweeping into the valley. The hellish explosions were followed by an enormous storm-like wind that would have blown me off my feet if I hadn't gripped the rough bark of the nearest uh, spruce and pressed myself against it. The earth shook. The air was filled with the rumble of airplane motors, the whistle of falling bombs, the detonations, and the winds that followed. We fully expected the entire valley had been completely laid to waste. But when it was finally over, we found that our neighborhood and the whole area was undamaged. 
The bombs had destroyed the Nazi settlement on the mountain, but left everything else unmarked. Bomber Command accomplishments. This is the really important part. Uh, in a single sentence, what happened is um, the, um, uh, the strategic bombing offensive of America, Canada, and Britain uh, defeated uh, the defense of the right campaign of the Luftwaffe, and we destroyed Germany's ability to make war. Germany entered 45 with almost 3 million men in the field, but Bomber Command um, deprived most of them of boots and bullets, uh, petrol for their tanks and aircrafts, and everything else they needed to wage war. Um, so, during the war, Bomber Command prevailed in its air war against the Luftwaffe and in its war assisting Allied armies. D-Day and the crossing of the Rhine would have been very different experiences without Bomber Command. Best of all, Bomber Command destroyed Germany's industrial economy and therefore their ability to wage war. Now, the war at sea. One distinguished historian said that all Bomber Command did in the war at sea was bomb a single submarine. That was it. Sunk one submarine. In fact, Bomber Command sunk or disabled eight of the 19 warships in Germany's high seas fleet, destroyed a third of Germany's U-boats um, at their bases, destroyed Germany's light surface naval force in the English Channel, largely through the Royal Canadian Air Force laying mines, sank or damaged a thousand ships of the German merchant marine, and blockaded every port from the Bay of Biscay to Norway, and tied up 40% of the German Navy's personnel working on mine sweeping full time. That was our war at sea. So now we go to the Germans, the German Research Institute for Military History. I went to the Germans because I'd gone through about 200 Bomber Command books and they're all using weasel words on accomplishments. And it dawned on me, we never really knew what Bomber Command accomplished, but the Germans did. The Germans knew exactly what they accomplished. This is what the Germans say about uh, Dresden. This is their uh, German Research Institute for Military History, which is very, very prestigious. They say, as a synonym for the indiscriminate bombing of the German population, attacks on Dresden have had spun around them a web of great deal of legend and myth, which prove after critical examination to be speculation and exaggerated accounts, mistakes, or even the product of the imagination. So what does the Institute say Bomber Command accomplished? Uh, one of the most important things is we destabilized the Nazi leadership because we made a fool out of Goring and he was the heir apparent. This caused the other uh, major figures, Martin Bormann, Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler, Speer and others, to work at cross purposes to one another and sometimes really at cross purposes to Germany itself in order to destroy one another and to try to impress Hitler. That was the first thing. Secondly, Bomber Command forced the diversion of a million soldiers from fighting at the fronts into shooting down our aircraft inside Germany. A million soldiers. Because we, they never knew where Bomber Command was going to drop their bombs. So they had to have these soldiers everywhere, in every town and city in the whole country, even if the place was only bombed once a year or was never bombed at all. They had a million soldiers tied down in Germany that should have been fighting at the fronts. Uh, Bomber Command forced Germany to divert half of its essential 88 millimeter anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns and 160 million rounds of ammunition back to Germany to shoot down our aircraft instead of blowing up Soviet tanks. And these were the only weapons that could destroy Soviet tanks. Uh, Bomber Command forced Germany to employ hundreds of thousands of additional personnel, some by necessity highly skilled, to frantically repair damage Bomber Command inflicted. And really important, Bomber Command caused Hitler to devote massive materials for all of his magic weapons that would somehow save them in the war. As Albert Speer says, um, Germany's failed search for an armament miracle caused erratic changes to war production and massive amounts of labor and material were poured into projects that fizzled. A couple of other things completely destroyed the judicial system and so uh, these uh, Nazi courts took over. Uh, the Gestapo spent the final years, the months of the war essentially just executing people in the so-called courts. And it destroyed the municipal administrations. I'm a municipal lawyer. Uh, when the municipal administration is destroyed, uh, life in the city gets very, very difficult. Um, and it was taken over by the Nazi party and the Hitler youth. So here are the uh, conclusions of the German Institute. The finale of the bombing put everything else that happened in the shade. Morale had sunk to rock bottom, saturation rates paralyzed the fire, civil defense, administration, and air defense services. And then the Institute concludes by saying, quote, it was becoming clear 
that neither the bunkers nor the magic weapons could offer any protection against the bombs. The realization that they'd been left defenseless against Allied bombing made a great part of the German population abandon all hope of the final victory that Nazi propaganda was heralding. So, what do the Germans say, the German leaders? Uh, Franklin Roosevelt said, when Hitler built Fortress Europe, he forgot to put a roof over it. <laughs> Joseph Goebbels, in his top secret uh, diaries, he was the Reich's Minister for Total War and the Propaganda Minister, he said that um, the absence of the roof Roosevelt was referring to was the cardinal problem of problems. That is where the real weakness of our conduct of the war lay. What do other German leaders tell us? Let's start with Hitler. Adolf Hitler, just days before his suicide, said his foreign minister to his foreign minister von Ribbentrop, the real cause of Germany's defeat was the failure of the German Air Force. Another way of saying that is our allied air forces won the war. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel told Hitler face to face, if you can't stop the bombing, we can't win the war. And then I list a whole bunch of other generals here and they're all saying much the same thing. We lost control of the air, air power was the decisive factor in Germany's defeat. So let's turn to Albert Speer, he's the munitions minister who knew better than any other German what Bomber Command accomplished, because he had to replace everything. This is what Albert Speer said, Germany's failure to defeat Bomber Command was Germany's greatest lost battle of the whole war. The strategic bombing offensive did more damage to the German war effort than losing every battle in Russia, including the surrender of Stalingrad, because bombing continually damaged with ever increasing ferocity and then ultimately destroyed Germany's ability to produce the means necessary to make war. Isn't that the clearest possible statement? What did the Allied leaders say? General Eisenhower wrote to General Marshall in September 44, British Bomber Command is one of the most effective parts of our entire organization, always seeking and finding and using more ways, new ways for their particular type of aircraft to be of assistance. Eisenhower also told Marshall that Sir Arthur Harris not only willingly supports the ground operation, but he actually proved to be one of the most respected and cooperative members of our whole team. Then there's Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, who is not known for idle comments, Montgomery said, I doubt whether any single man did war in the, I'm sorry, I doubt whether any single man did more in winning the war than Arthur Harris did. That's Montgomery. I doubt whether any single man did more in winning the war than Harris did. General Eisenhower summed it up saying, Bomber Command achieved the impossible. Post-war as president, Eisenhower wrote to Harris, a special word of thanks should be given to you for your skill and selfless dedication to the cause in which we all served. No historian could possibly be aware of the depths of my obligation to you. This is President Eisenhower to Air Chief Marshal Air, um, Sir Arthur Harris. No historian could possibly be aware of the depths of my obligations to you. So, post-war, uh, defamation by media, academics, politicians of Bomber Command and our Bomber Boys is a terrible wrong. I feel it's got to be made right. Too many people older than I am, what they think they know about Bomber Command is wrong. Worse, pretty much anybody younger than I am has never heard of Bomber Command. My quest is to help make right the historic wrongs that broke the spirit of some Bomber Boys and also hurt their children and their grandchildren. Australia has the concept of the Bomber Command family. Remember, one out of every five Australians was killed in that war. So they're just counting the kids, the grandkids, and the uh, great-grandkids, three generations. Uh, and it's 250,000 Australians. Now, for us, we lost one out of every four Canadians, not one out of every five, one out of every four. And also, it's not fair just to talk about the descendants because a huge number of bomber boys didn't have any descendants because they were all killed. So the nieces and nephews are really important because that's all they've got. So if you um, make it a Canadian thing and you include all the nieces and nephews, I bet we got over two million people in our uh, Bomber Command family. So this is the RCAF uh, 100th anniversary, it's the centenary, and I submit Bomber Command was the Royal Canadian Air Force's greatest achievement and our Bomber Boys are among Canada's greatest heroes. 
They deserve to be remembered. Thank you. So we've got a, a bunch of books. I've actually already signed them, but for anybody that wants um, me to say something special, I can do that as well. And um, people may have questions. Um, does anybody have a really great question that will really inspire all of us? James? <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought you were. Uh, is there anybody that would like to ask a question, something that's kind of on their mind? Yes? Uh, I know that Albert Speer talked about the. Uh he actually put specific numbers at one point, the number of aircraft, uh, tanks, trucks, etc., that he did not have because of the various bombing campaigns. Were you able to verify any of those actual numbers? Well, in my book, in my book, I have um, dedicated an entire chapter to uh, Speer and who he was and what his relationship with Hitler was and what they had to do. And it's truly extraordinary because the, the Germans keep such accurate records on everything. And, and you know, making this into a pre save for tonight was actually quite a challenge. Um, uh, they, they do have extraordinary uh, records and uh, Speer is one of the sources. Yes? Uh, I, I don't know enough about Coventry to know if it was much of a military target. I know that the British did nothing to defend it because so doing would allow the Germans to um, uh, uh, figure out that we had broke the code. And so we sort of sat by and they, they destroyed the place. But mainly I'm aware of that Greek cathedral. So, uh, and I, I'm not sure how the Germans feel about all of that. But, but I'll say this. Um, I went to Ditchley Park and that's where all of the code breaking and all of that was being done. It really helps when you go to all these places. I went to all of these places and talked to the various people. Like I would never have figured out what was going on in Fairview and the you know, Peace River if I didn't go there. Well, uh, uh, two things about uh, Ditchley Park. First, remember Catherine, Princess of Wales, her grandfather was teaching people to fly in Calgary and then he was transferred back to Britain about the same time as my dad and he flew all those combat sorties as well. Catherine's grandmother was uh, one of the women at Ditchley Park. And what I learned at Ditchley Park, what I learned at Ditchley Park is they were just as good at breaking our codes as we were at breaking their codes. And they got just as much information out of us as we got out of them. The difference was we put the, universe, we put the information to use immediately. Bomber Command would learn of something on a Thursday, they'd have something built by Saturday, they'd have it tested by Monday, and they'd be using it on Tuesday. I mean, it was just astonishing how Bomber Command kept modifying. But Germany had a totally different system of governance, and Hitler was the great bottleneck. And so they didn't make a fraction of the use out of their information that we made out of ours. We got every last ounce of use out of our information, and a lot of their information was not acted on. But uh, on the actual breaking of codes, they were getting as much from us as we got from them. Yes? Did you find uh, the book A Thousand Must Fall? Oh, that's, is that, uh, is that uh, um, yes. Peden? Yeah, from Winnipeg. Yeah. Uh, Sir Arthur Harris said that was the best book ever written about Bomber Command. He's from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and um, probably the best book ever written about war. He just died about a year and a half ago, which is a real shame. I would have really liked to have met him. His book is absolutely magnificent. It's, uh, it's, it's really, truly extraordinary. And, uh, and you know, one of the things he was talking about was how they, they framed up the crews. You know, sort of everybody's all in one huge room and you kind of tried to pick your crews and he said the key thing was picking the um, the pilot you know you wanted the pilot that really knew what he was doing he comparing it to if it was a marriage he said uh, you know uh, you could get a bird brain wife and uh, and she might actually be very pleasing in a lot of different ways but if you have a bird brain pilot you're dead. <laughs> uh, the book is magnificent. After the war, he became a great lawyer, and then he became um, Manitoba's first uh, commissioner uh, to try to get some law and order into their stock exchange and to the, um, the financial operations. Uh, oh, he, it's Murray Pedden. Murray Pedden. He's a true Canadian hero. Yes. Yes. What surprised you most in your research? 
What surprised me more than anything was the extraordinary contribution Canada made. And it's one of the criticisms I do have of Sir Winston Churchill. He found it almost impossible to utter the word Canada. Uh, he liked the word empire. And if forced, you know, at the point of a gun, he might say commonwealth. But um, it gave me the erroneous impression that we were a comic sideshow or we were very minor. And we weren't. We were actually in the center of everything. We were the admiration, really, of the world. That aircraft of our, our, our you know, our, our um, Air, Air Force was extraordinary, but so was our Navy. We took control of the North Atlantic. I mean, Churchill never mentioned Bomber Command in his final speech. He didn't name the Royal Canadian Navy either. Somehow our 494 warships weren't doing much of anything while his three British destroyers were freeing up the Atlantic, you know. I mean, it just, it's so, it, it, he really had a, a thing about he wanted us to be the Empire. And I thought William Shire's book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, I thought that was, you know, the definitive statement. Well, if you look at the index, Canada's in there twice, and it's both times referring to the Shadow Frontenac Hotel in Quebec City. Other than that, we didn't do anything, uh, anything at all. Um, my, um, my former sister-in-law was the Dean of Arts at UBC. I only mention that because it's the biggest um, um, faculty on campus. It's one of the biggest universities in the nation. And I flew to St. Louis, Missouri for the funeral of her father. And because I come all the way from Vancouver, people were trying to be really nice to me. This was about 20 years ago. And we're all sitting around in the living room after this, and they were all World War II veterans. And I mean, they've got a daughter who's the Dean of Arts and one of Canada's biggest. These people were well-educated people. There wasn't a single person there that knew that Canada was in the war. That they won all by themselves. <laughs> and so that, that's, I had no idea Canada accomplished miracles. And you know how I first got tuned into this? For reasons I will never understand, when Deng Xiaoping, right after the Cultural Revolution, invited Canada to send a delegation of lawyers because they were getting very interested in law and order as opposed to out of the rule of a gun, uh, the first delegation came and went and then for some reason, they made me the head of the second delegation. We had members of the Queen's Privy Council in, in that delegation, but I was the head of it. And the Chinese didn't really know what to do with a 27-year-old that was leading us. But we had all these great seminars. Ultimately, they thought we were wonderful. We had seminars with the Supreme Court of China, uh, with the Faculty of Law, with the Municipal Administration in Shanghai. We were in a penitentiary in the country, most of which was all organized by me, because the Chinese would just sort of go along with all this stuff. Um, but. We had a dinner in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, and I was seated beside the guy that was in charge of the entire English-speaking world. And he knew all the Canadian Prime Ministers, the British Prime Ministers, the American Presidents. He knew anybody that spoke English. And when he was speaking, he only spoke in Mandarin, and he had it translated sentence by sentence so he could watch the reaction. But the fact is, his English was fluent. He told me that no country in history did what Canada did in World War II. There is no country anywhere ever that mobilized the way we did, or as effectively as we did, and as magnificently as we did. He's the guy that's telling me all this stuff that the uh, Alberta public school system should have been telling me. Yeah. Uh, and it was all news to me. It was all news to me. But he told me that what Canada did uh, bordered on the unbelievable. It was so impressive. Yes? Yes, it's called William Lyon Mackenzie King. He did not want us to get lost in the Imperial armies like in World War I. And he certainly did not want to end up in a trench anywhere. I mean, he uh, was spending $1.6 billion on that air training program because he was putting our money where his mouth was. And it was a struggle. Churchill did not want it. Sir Arthur Harris did not want it. The leaders of the Air Force did not want it in Britain. The leaders of the Air Force in Canada really wanted it <laughs> because we're so different. And we had to keep reminding them. We were there to help them, but we were not there to serve them. We had some real clashes. You know, Cranwell College is the most elite place you know, for the uh, Air Force in Britain. There was the revolt at Cranbrook. 
called the Canadian Revolt at uh, uh, Cranwell College. Our guys were there to learn navigation techniques and stuff, but there was some corporal or something in the British Army that, that was uh, uh, sort of thought this was boot camp and stuff and would have them lined up for parades and blah blah and they just rebelled. We just walked back to our quarters, they sent an air marshal in, we're going to teach you colonists how to blah blah and that did it, the word colonists. We went back, we piled up all the furniture in our barracks and we set everything on fire. And then we sent two of our guys to London, AWOL, where um, er Massey was the uh, commissioner at that time. He became the first Canadian governor general, but he was our high commissioner in London. And he sent back a squadron leader and <laughs> made it crystal clear to the British. This is a totally separate air force. This is an air force with its own command. We are not there to serve anybody. We are simply there to help. And, and uh, that was a great drama. That was a, a key moment for the British that they had a tiger by the tail, you know, with Canada. And um, uh, ultimately, well, ultimately, we had the um, highest um, success rate on targets, and we had the lowest casualty rate when we had planes that the British thought were garbage. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto, as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.